First of all, we have church tonight too, amen, at 7 o'clock or 6.30, prayer at 5.30, an hour before that service. It's a completely different service, different sermon, uh, different songs, everything, different song leader. <laughs> so you want to come tonight, amen, and, and uh, join us and, and be a part of, of what God is doing here at the church, amen. Uh, so uh, we're also... Um, going to have church on Wednesday, 7 p.m., prayer at 6, and we do have prayer meeting here at the church every weekday morning uh, from 7 to 8 in the morning, and so we we uh, do believe in prayer, amen. We want to ask God to help us, amen. I mean, no, God moves in response to prayer, amen, amen. amen. so so we, we treasure that uh, time uh, to get to, together with the Lord, amen. Uh, actually, you know, as a Christian, we, we should be praying all the time, amen, uh, every day, thanking God and, and for the various things He does in our lives, amen, and so I just encourage you to, to come join us. If you can't come to the church for prayer, I really encourage you to start your day off with prayer, amen, start it off with prayer and in the Word of God. That will be a great blessing to your life, praise God. So, <clears throat> let's see, next Sunday, the 14th, uh, uh, is daylight savings time, so that means we all got to get up an hour earlier. All right. Uh, glory to God, huh? <laughs> and so, spring forward. So that means Saturday night, we've got to set our clocks ahead an hour. Okay, and so just keep that in mind. And we have a special treat next Sunday, and uh, 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 Pastor uh, Child Perez is going to come and preach for us Sunday all services. Uh, we, he pastors one of our churches in Albuquerque, and so I spoke to him and prevailed upon him to, to come, and so he's going to uh, just come and do the Sunday for us, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably wish that we had him preaching longer, but praise God, it'll be a blessing to have him with us next week, and so he's a little gangster from the streets, and so uh, he, uh, he got saved and powerfully changed, and so he's, he's a great preacher as well, amen. Uh, so, uh, and then on the 25th of this month, we're going to uh, uh, go back and help with the 40 Days for Life uh, outreach. Um, and uh, and so that's out there in front of the, the Walmart parking lot. We Our, our slot is, um, is 1 o'clock to 7 o'clock, amen. And so we'll go out there, take a, uh, you know, a speaker and set up and, and play some music and pray walk, hold a sign, and it's all about, it's all about uh, uh, life of, of unborn, precious unborn children, amen, and so uh, if you can join us out there, that'll be a great blessing, amen, uh, that you'll see folks out there in front of Walmart uh, starting uh, from uh, Ash Wednesday up into the Easter week, and so that's going to be going on, uh, some of those folks are troopers, they're there, every single day, amen, and so <clears throat> uh, pray uh, that God will will end the scourge of abortion in our nation, amen, amen. and so let's, uh, let's support that, and you know, if you can't go out there, at least pray, God, uh, you know, give our legislators the courage to stand up against this thing, amen, so praise God, uh, so that's all the announcements for now, I uh, want to take a few moments to Oh, I just want to uh, say a word of thanks as well for those who have been helping us uh, up here on the hill. We're setting up uh, a display up there for Easter. Uh, we're calling it uh, we're calling it the Stations of the Cross and the Roman Road. Amen. And so we're setting up a display 
uh, and uh, we're going to invite people in the community to come and and see walk. It's a walk through thing where they can look and see uh, what Jesus did for us. Amen. From the from the Last Supper to the resurrection. Amen. Amen. And so, praise God. Uh, we're going to have flyers for that and uh, and do some advertising. And so. Um, uh, there have been folks helping with that work, amen, and uh, we appreciate all of you, and I'd like to encourage the church to pray uh, and ask God to bless that, amen, to bring people who will see it and, and whose hearts will be touched, and that they'll realize what Jesus did for them and open their hearts to Christ, amen. So let's, uh, let's pray for that as well. Praise God, amen. So that's all the announcements. Let's thank God as our ushers come. We're going to receive our offering. Lord Jesus, we give you all the praise and all the glory for all that you do. Amen. You know, uh, Jesus, when he came to the earth, he, he, uh, uh, in one place, a man said, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, he said, foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And it wasn't that Jesus uh, took a, a vow of poverty. What Jesus did was he made his life um, uh, single purposed, which was to preach the gospel and to bring the good news to a lost world. The good news is, is in contrast to the bad news. The bad news is that uh, without Jesus, uh, we're going to go into the judgment of God. And, and have to pay for our own sins. The good news is that uh, with Jesus, a faith in him will save us from the penalty of our own sin. There's forgiveness. And so his life was lived for that purpose. And so his disciples traveled with him and, and uh, it says that there were certain women in different places that supported the ministry uh, from their own substance. Uh, one of uh, Herod's servants was one of those, King Herod. And uh, there were many people who gave to his disciples and who uh, carried the, the money bag for their ministry. But the point I'm making is that their ministry was supported by the giving of others. Amen. Amen. And, uh, and Jesus could have, you know, very easily provided for himself and his disciples. At one point, he... You know, he uh, told Peter, go and go fishing. And the first fish you pull out of the, the lake is going to have a coin in its mouth. When you open its mouth, you're going to see a coin there. And you can take that and go pay our taxes. I mean, no, Jesus could have supported his entire ministry that way if he wanted to. Amen. But, but that's not what he did. What he did was he allowed people to have expression in supporting his ministry. Amen. And it's still the same today. You know, God could miraculously don't, you know, thousands of dollars into our bank account if he wanted to. But that's that's not how it works. The way it works is people, ordinary people like you and I, amen, we give faithfully every week, amen, or every, through, throughout the month and the years and support the work of God, amen. And you know what that does? That gives us a privilege of being a part of what God is doing, amen. amen. And it also gives God something to bless us for for our giving and our sacrifice, amen. How I many know uh, God needs something to bless? You know, it's amen. like the, when he fed the 5,000, they said, well, we have five loaves and two fish. But Jesus blessed that, and it was enough to feed everybody. But it was something that was given that he was able to bless. And so when we give, what we're doing is we're, we're getting to be a part of what God is doing, but we're also giving God something that he can bless us for. Amen. Amen. And so let's keep that in mind as we receive the offering this morning. Uh, we're going to pray and ask God's blessing. Our heads are bowed. <clears throat> Brother David, would you please ask God's blessing on this offering? Well, I come to you, Lord. I, I pray to you, Lord, that you bless this offering in tithes, Lord. That you bless us with um, compassion, Lord, with uh, love, with forgiveness, mercy, and with grace, Lord, and with that we know that we cannot pay you back for all that you have done for us, the gifts and the miracles that you do on a on a daily basis for all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. When I die, I will be
chapter 24. You know, one of the most vital messages of the church today, which can be a highly unpopular message, but is greatly needed, is what I'm going to preach on today. A highly unpopular message. Um, but I want to, what I want to speak to, uh, to you about today is the judgment to come. Um, amen. Uh, in his book, Escape the Coming Night, uh, Dr. David uh, Jeremiah uh, wrote that every true prophet has warned the world of the judgment to come. Uh, he mentioned a few of them, and you can look them up and read as you read the scriptures yourself. Samuel, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Jonah, Paul, and even Jesus. All of them spoke of coming judgment. And uh, it's important because uh, there is a contrast that has to be made. You know, contrasts are important because that's the way you know something. Uh, Edna had uh, read this little quote in a, in a book that she was reading. It said, Satan is simply a tool of God. He is used to draw people closer to God. Consider these simple facts. The word go would have no meaning if there was no word stop. The word up would mean nothing unless there was a way down. There can be no good unless there is evil to compare it to. Everything has to have an opposite to exist. And it reminds me of a little incident that took place in our home when our children were small. My son Samuel was, I don't know, he was maybe three. Uh, and uh, uh, he's, he, you know, he had a lot of funny things that he said, but uh, one day uh, they were eating dinner and I wasn't there at the moment. I was working and Edna had cooked something and, uh, and uh, the kids took a bite and Samuel made a face and said, this tastes like hell. <laughs> Edna's eyes got about this big. And she said, she's like, where did you learn? And she's walking him back to the spanking room when it hit her. She thought about it and she said, you know, whenever something tasted good, she would say, oh, this tastes like heaven. And evidently, whatever it was that she made that day <laughs> tasted like hell. <laughs> and so she had to stop and say, okay, I get it. I'm not gonna beat him. He wasn't just saying a bad word. <laughs> he was making this comparison. There is a difference between good and evil. Can you say amen? Yeah. And so, so the scripture I want to read to you uh, is from the life of the Apostle Paul. He, is, he has been arrested. Uh, he's being held as a prisoner in Caesarea. And uh, uh, the, uh, the ruler at that time was a man by the name of Felix. And so Felix... Uh, wanted to hear what Paul had to say. And so we're just going to read two verses here in Acts chapter 24, verse 24 and 25. It says, And after some days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul. 
and heard him concerning the faith in Jesus. So here's what Paul had to say. Now, as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now when I have a convenient time. I will call for you. And so in the message that Paul brought to this leader, who actually had the power to release him if he wanted to, in that message, he spoke to him about these things. He spoke to him about righteousness. You know, I thought of that, you know, as a, as a Christian and as a teacher of, of the Word of God, I uh, understand that righteousness does, is not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of God that comes through faith in Jesus Christ. None of us have righteousness of our own. We depend on God to make us righteous. So I'm sure in his message, he, he explained that to, to Felix, and he spoke about self-control. Amen. When, when we get saved and start serving God, we absolutely have to learn how to exercise self-control. We have to control our appetites, amen. We have to bring our flesh under subjection and make it obey Christ, okay? But he also spoke of the judgment to come. And so judgment is a very important message in the word of God, amen. Gospel preachers are not called to speak only positive motivational messages. And there are some who that's all they ever do. In, uh, in the book, Escape the Coming Night, uh, David Jeremiah uh, quotes uh, this man, Dr. David W. A. Criswell. Says he reminds us of the true character of a prophet of God. Whenever there is a true prophet of God, he will preach judgment. These modern so-called ministers of God speak all things nice, uh, most pedagogical, that's a big word for teaching, methods admonish never to mention things negative. Ignore them and they will not exist. There's not any hell and there's not any devil and there's not any judgment of God. All that is now intellectually passé. We have evolved beyond that. So we stand up and speak of the love of Jesus. We speak of peace and we speak of all things pretty and beautiful. But the same book that tells us about the good tells us about the bad. The same revelation that speaks to us about heaven speaks to us about hell. Amen. And so I wanna speak about this judgment that there, there, it's necessary to speak of the impending judgment of God. And the impending judgment of God is for every person on the earth. Now, I'm not ta talking about the end of the world. What I'm talking about is the end of our world. In, in Hebrews 9.27 it says, as it is appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. Okay, so what is judgment? Judgment is very simple to understand. It is a time where every person will stand before a holy God and give an accounting of their life, where God will look at us and see what we have done with what God has given us. One thing that God has given to all of us is our life. Amen. We were created by God. We were created by him to know him to love him and to serve him, amen. And so he's given us the gift of life. But beyond that, what God did was he gave us Jesus. And you know what Jesus represents? Jesus represents the opportunity to be saved. Amen. It's the opportunity to obtain the eternal life that we could never have apart from Jesus. That's why Jesus said, I am the way the truth and the life. No man can come to the Father unless he comes by me. That was Jesus. You know, some people get really upset at us Christians and they say, well, you guys are so exclusive. Well, it's not our doctrine that makes Christianity exclusive. It is the teaching of Jesus himself. 
He said there's no other way to be saved except through Jesus Christ. And so what God did, what one of the things he's given us is this opportunity to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And along with that comes with the opportunity to be completely delivered from the power of sin. Amen. Completely delivered from Satan's power to dominate our lives. With Jesus comes forgiveness of our sin. With Jesus comes deliverance from sin's power, from <laughs> sin's penalty, which is eternal damnation. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So here is uh, the gift of God. What, what did God give to mankind? He gave us, all of us, the opportunity to gain eternal life through faith in Jesus. Amen. And so the question that, that every person is going to have to answer when they stand before God is what did you do with your opportunity to be saved? Did you take advantage of that? Did you say yes to Jesus and accept him as your Lord and Savior? Did you, uh, uh, from your heart, repent of your sin and give yourself to Jesus Christ? Or did you just continue in your sin? Right. You know, there's people who pray to receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior and then continue in their sin. Are they saved? Not in practice. There's, Jesus said, there's going to be a lot of people who, who come before me and say, Lord, Lord. But I say to you, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into heaven. Right. He said, there are those who are going to say, Lord, did we not do this in your name and that in your name? And, he, and he's going to say, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. That means that, you know, having a mental assent that, yeah, I believe in Jesus is not the same as a surrendered life. Amen. So the question would be, what did, what did you do with, with what I gave you? What did you do with my son Jesus? Did his life change your life? Amen. Right. Not only that, but with Jesus, with the gift of his son comes into humanity, into the realm or the sphere of human lives a new purpose and a new meaning for our lives amen. amen when i got saved i was completely lost i mean i believed in god i i grew up uh, going to church i grew up knowing who jesus was i believed what the bible taught that he was born of mary the virgin that, that he died on the cross for my sin. I had all that up here, but none of it was in here. And when Jesus changed my life, he brought me into a church. Right. And it was in that church where I discovered that God had more for me. That God had a purpose and a meaning for our life. You know, people go throughout this life, they, they go their whole life wondering, why was I even born? What is the meaning of my life? Does my life have meaning? Is there anything worthwhile to live for? I declare to you this morning that one of the great gifts God gives us through Jesus is that now I have a reason to live. Now I have a purpose for my life. Now I have a direction Hey, I'm headed to heaven. Amen. Amen. I'm not going to hell anymore. Thank you, Thank you Jesus. Yes, amen. One of the reasons I came to Christ was a revelation that, you know what? If I keep going the way I am, I'm going to go to hell. And literally, I, I had the hell scared out of me. And I gave my life to Christ. But I discovered there was so much more. See, God saved us all so that he could use our lives to save others. That's why we have a church. That's the purpose of a church, to declare the message of the gospel 
to those who don't know Jesus. So they can be saved. That's why Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. Baptize them, teach them the things that I taught you. So there's a real purpose that God has given to us. We are to be ambassadors for Christ. Amen. We're to carry the message of the gospel. And so when we stand before God on judgment day, I believe that one of the things that God is going to look at is what did we do with the purpose that he called us to? Are you involved in sharing the good news with the lost? Mm -hmm. You know, they say that most Christians never witness to someone else. Never tell them about Jesus. If we fail to fulfill his main purpose for saving us, what will we say when we stand before him? You know, the parable of the talents, he gave one uh, five, one uh, two, and one one, and, and you know, the first two doubled the the talents that he gave him. A talent was about $10,000 worth of silver or gold. And uh, the, the one who got one uh, buried his talent. He said, I was afraid of you, and I so I buried it, and, and now that you come back, here it is, give it back to him. You know what Jesus said to that servant? And it, this this is frightening. He, he, he said, he will say to him, you wicked and lazy servant. Why didn't you at least put it in the bank so it could gain interest? Why didn't you do the very least? And you know what he said to that servant? Or to his other servants, he says, take this man, Bind him in hand, bind him hand and foot, and throw him into the fire, which is hell. Yikes. God help us that when the judgment day comes, that what we'll hear is, Come on in, son. Come on in, daughter. Well done, you good and faithful servant. Amen. You've been faithful in a few things. Now let me reward you. I told you this is not a popular message. Judgment is never a popular thing. However, it is absolutely necessary. Amen. Now the world is moving toward judgment. Our world is moving toward judgment. Our world is on a collision course with the judgment of God. You know, they make all these movies about asteroids coming to destroy the earth. I'm going to tell you something. There's something more fearsome than an asteroid coming. Our world is on a collision course with the judgment of God. And so I want to shift gears and I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to deal so personally. That first point was very personal for each one of us because we're going to have to answer God for how we lived our lives. But when I shift gears here and talk about the judgment of the world at large, the first major judgment that, that is on the horizon, that is coming very soon to a city near you and all over the world, I believe is the rapture of the church of Jesus. This is going to be the beginning of the judgments. And so the mo a moment is coming that will be a turning point for the whole world. And I believe that moment is when Jesus returns to take his bride to heaven. Amen. The Bible talks about this in 1 Corinthians 50. It says, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be Change in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. And so the doctrine of the rapture is this, 
that Jesus is going to come. There's going to be the sound of a trumpet and everyone whose heart is right with God is going to be instantaneously transformed and caught up into heaven. Now, in, uh, in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, we see a parallel scripture. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote both of these. Okay, so he is, he is uh, giving people understanding of what is coming. In verse 13 of 1 Corinthians 4, it says, But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. So this is talking about people who have died in Christ, who, who died in faith. Okay? So uh, our loved ones who've gone before us. So he says, for if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. How many here believe Jesus died and rose again? Okay. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So those of our loved ones who have gone on before us are going to be raised from the dead if they're right with God. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend with a shout, descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. So this is talking about the rapture of the church, that there's going to come a moment in time. This is future, but one day it'll be history. A moment will come where God says, okay, it's time. The trumpet sounds. The Lord descends from heaven, not all the way to the earth, but in the clouds, the trumpet is going to sound and he's going to say, come up here and the whole church is going to be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. All around the world, millions of Christians are going to disappear. Make no mistake. The rapture will be a blessing for the church, but not for the world. Not for the world, because what happens next is the beginning of the end for the world. See, Jesus spoke of this in Matthew 24. His disciples asked him, what are the signs of your coming in the end of the age? And so he answered their question. And he didn't answer their question with a question. He answered their question with a warning. He said, take heed that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. He says, you're going to hear about wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be all these things that happen, pestilences, uh, nation and kingdom rising against each other, earthquakes and all these things. But the end is not yet. And then in verse 14 of Matthew 24, he says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. So once the gospel is completed and the preaching of the gospel is completed, uh, the Apostle Paul called it the time of the Gentiles, uh, and, and that means people who were outside of the nation of Israel could believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. But when the last Gentile is saved, we don't know who they are. We don't know their name, but mark it down. God knows. And the moment it's completed, the rapture is going to happen and the church is going to be gone. And then the Antichrist will come. So in this, in this text, in Matthew 24, he said, in this, the gospel of this kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And then in verse 15, he says, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, that's the Antichrist, 
spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And then in verse 21, he says, for then there will be great tribulation, such has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. So the rapture of the church is a judgment on this world. I mean, no, the world does not love the church today. The world doesn't love the church, it never did. Jesus said, don't be surprised if men hate you because of my name. He said, remember, before they hated you, they hated me. And so Christians shouldn't be too, too upset when, you know, judgments are passed against us. Amen. You know, a gov government doesn't, doesn't really love the church. You know why? Because the church stands for righteousness. The church stands for freedom. Amen. Right, man. You know, this nation that we live in was founded by Christian men right, who stood for freedom. And it's freedom to believe. Now, we live in a culture where government wants to rule. They want to flex their muscles, say, you've got to be locked down, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. They're shutting down churches in places. I've shared that there, uh, there's a pastor in Canada right now in jail because he said, no, we have to have church. This is We're going to obey God instead of men. I read an article about that church and uh, heard an interview by his wife, and, and they said, we're not just flaunting uh, you know, our faith in, the, in their face. We're doing everything that, that uh, they're recommending that we do. Social distancing, masks, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you're sick, stay home. All, all those various things. Nevertheless, they came after this man and our neighbor to the north and he is in jail. Right. And so whether that happens or not, um, the, the point is the world does not love the church and it never has and it never will but one thing I do want to say about that the world may not love the church but they desperately need the church yes, amen. they don't realize it they don't know that their only hope for eternal life is found in the church of Jesus Christ and that when Christians fulfill their purpose and their duty to preach the gospel, they're doing the greatest service possible to the people of the world. Yes, amen. Whether they like it or not, the gospel is the only thing that can save anyone. Because in Jesus, there's forgiveness. In Jesus, there's deliverance. In Jesus, there's eternal life. In Jesus, there's escape from hell. Yes, amen. But when the church is gone, all hell is going to come to earth. Because right now, what is holding back the evil that is crouched, ready to spring, is the Spirit of God that lives in the church. Amen. It is praying people. It is praying saints who are calling on God to have mercy. That's one of the reasons we pray for our nation. Amen. God have mercy on our nation. Don't give us what we deserve. If God were to give us what we deserve, this nation would burn in a day. Amen. Amen. You think Amen. of all the evil that has been propagated by our own government. Amen. They legalized the murder of innocent children. And millions, probably close to a hundred million babies who have been murdered in the name of convenience and women's rights. How many know God didn't die for our rights? He died for our wrongs. Amen. Amen. And so if God were to give us what we deserve, we'd already be up in smoke. But you know what keeps back the judgment of God? The prayers of the righteous. Amen. 
Remember Abraham prayed to God. God said, I'm going to destroy Sodom. And he said, God, well, what if there's 50 righteous people? Will you spare it? Yes. What about 40? Yes. What about 30? Yes. 20? Yes. 10? Yes. One man praying would have reverted the judgment of God and something that if he had said one, God may have said yes. I don't know. But he stopped at 10. There's a turning point coming to this world. And it's going to be the rapture of the church. When the church is raptured, the Antichrist is going to rise. The four horsemen of the tribulation will ride. Amen. Amen. Revelation 6. This is after the rapture of the church. John is writing. He says, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals that I, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. That's the Antichrist. On a white horse, like Jesus. I mean, no, Jesus is going to come on a white horse. But he's not going to have a bow. He's going to have a sword. That with it he should strike the nations. This is the Antichrist coming. Verse 3. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out. And it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. This re represents war. That the people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Verse 5. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarii. And three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do no harm to the oil and the wine. You know what that means? A denarius was a day's work. So can imagine you imagine working a whole day for a quart of wheat. That's like a day's wages just to survive. So that's talking about famine. Verse seven. Then he opened the fourth seal, and I heard a voice. The fourth living creature said, Come and see. So I looked and behold a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hades followed him. And power was given over them to, uh, over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. See, the great tribulation will be judgment. It will be hell on earth. And Satan will be unleashed to do his worst. That's why the rapture of the church is a judgment. It's a blessing for those who are saved, but it's not a blessing for those who aren't saved. That's why we have to preach the gospel. Even in the midst of all this, though, beloved, is that there will be hope. Amen. People will turn to Jesus during that time. See, here's one of the truths about God that you'll find in the Bible, is that God never leaves the earth without a witness for himself. Amen. He never leaves people without a witness to him. Multitudes are going to be saved in the great tribulation. If you keep reading here in, in uh, Revelation 6, it says, Then he opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. People slain for the word of God during the great tribulation. It says they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. 
This is all during the Great Tribulation. Now, if you jump into chapter 7, in verse 9, it says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and honor, uh, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might, be to our God forever and ever. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night and is in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat for the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of waters and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. <coughs> These are the people who get saved during the great tribulation. Those who get saved during the great tribulation will be killed because they refuse to worship the beast. Because they refuse to take his mark on their right hand or in their forehead. And so they're killed. And so David Jeremiah writes a little bit about this time. And he talks about the witness, the silent witness that was uh, uh, a man by the name of Dr. Henry Morris describes this. So listen to this. Millions upon millions of copies of the Bible and portions of the Bible have been published in all major languages and distributed throughout the world through dedicated ministries like the Gideons, the Wycliffe Bible Translators and other such organizations. Removal of believers from the world at the rapture will not remove the scriptures. And multitudes who will no doubt be constrained to read the Bible in those days. I mean, you know, when people are hurting, they read the Bible. Thus many will turn to their Creator and Savior at that time and will be willing to give their testimony for the Word of God and even to give their lives as they seek to persuade the world that the calamities they are suffering are judgments from the Lord. The next time you stay in a hotel or motel, pull open the top drawer of the dresser and look for the Gideon Bible. Imagine some distraught man, his wife and children mysteriously gone, picking up that book soon after the great disappearing act. He doesn't know one scripture from another, so he leaves through and sees the book of Acts. I must act on something, he thinks. Then he reads what Peter said about Jesus. With each word, his heart is moved and soon his tears are falling on the thin pages. It must be true, this is what my wife believed, but now she's gone. God save me, he cries. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12, Jesus, forgive me, he saw, save me from this hell on earth. People are gonna Turn to God during that time when judgment comes. And so the point is, we know this is coming. We should know. If you don't know, if you didn't know, you do now. And the most important thing that you can do in your own life is to surrender yourself to Christ. To give your life to Jesus, to humble yourself and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me. See, God gave his son. He gave us his son to save us from our sins, to save us from judgment. 
This, this message is not a popular message, but it is absolutely necessary. So when, when Paul had an opportunity to talk to Felix, this governor who had the power to release him, what did he, what did he say? It says he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come. And it says Felix was afraid. He said, uh, I'll get back with you. I'll get back to you on that. I want to encourage you this morning. Don't put off getting right with God. Don't put off making peace, your peace, with God. The Bible says that we have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We're natural born sinners, all of us. We, we, we were birthed into it, we can't help it. That's, it was just passed down to us from generation to generation. But God gave us the answer. He made a way for every one of us to avoid the judgment. He made a way so that when we stand before God, and he says, what did you do with my son Jesus? Jesus can righteously stand on our behalf and say, this one believed in me. This one did my will. And when God looks at us, you know what? He doesn't see all our old nastiness that was there. What he sees is Jesus in us. He sees us covered, our sins washed away, dressed in a white robe, righteous because of our faith in the Son of God, and because of our faithfulness to Him throughout our life. And so I encourage you this morning, if you're not born again, give your life to Jesus. If you are born again, serve Him with all your heart. Amen. This is not a game that we're involved in. This is for eternity. Amen. Now, weren't you encouraged this morning? Amen. <laughs> I am. I just want to serve God. Lord Jesus, help me. Help me to do your will. Because I don't want to go there. I want to go there. I want to go to heaven. Amen. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads together. As we bring this service to a close, I really do appreciate you coming to church, amen. And You know, this is a message that can save the soul. It's a very simple message. It's, all it is is Jesus' message. He said, he who believes in me shall never die. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Because I am the resurrection and the life. The only one that can save us is Jesus. I can't save you. This church can't save you. No church can save you. The only one who can save us is the Lord himself. And thank God that he chose to save us. You know, when he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Three times he asked his father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. In other words, I don't want to do this. But he made a decision there and he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And you know, the most courageous man that ever lived on this earth was Jesus. Because he knew what was coming and he did it anyway. He went to the cross and he died there for us. That's how much God loves us. The Bible says God proved his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And I don't know anybody who loves me that much. Maybe my mom. But that's God. That's the God we serve. He so desperately does not want us to come into judgment 
and he sent his son to make it possible for us to avoid that judgment. Maybe you've come here this morning and you're not right with God. You're not saved. But today you want to give your life to Jesus. You want to be born again. You want to receive Christ as your Savior. You want his forgiveness. It's a very simple thing to do. All it takes is us saying, you know what, God? I admit I'm a sinner and I need you to forgive me. A simple prayer to ask Jesus for forgiveness. To invite Jesus to come into your heart as your Lord and Savior. That's really all it takes. And then a decision from then on that, you know what? I'm going to do what you want me to do. I have a new purpose in my life. I have something to live for now. And you follow that and you'll make it. You'll make it to heaven. So if you've come here today and you're not right with God and you want prayer, I'll pray with you. I'll be happy to. And you want Jesus in your life. If that's you, I just want you to do one thing for me. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I'd like you to just lift up your hands and say, yes, Pastor, pray for me. I want Jesus to come into my life quickly. Anyone at all? Raise up your hand. God bless you. Thank you. Who else? Anyone else? Yes. I see those hands. Amen. Anyone else? Quickly. Just raise it up. Say, yes, pray for me, Pastor. I want to get right with God. Just lift it up and hold it for just a moment where I can see it. God bless you. I see your hand. Amen. Anyone else? Join these three. Say, yes, Pastor. Pray for me. I want Jesus to come into my life. Okay, I'm going to say a prayer with you. And I want you to mean it from your own heart that you know what God I, I do need Jesus I want to be forgiven and I want to make heaven my home you know and maybe you're, you're watching this later on YouTube and you can pray this with us as well and Jesus will forgive your sin so let's pray our heads are bowed we're going to ask God to bring forgiveness say this with me and mean it from your heart Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner, and I know it. I'm sorry for all my sin, and I ask you to forgive me. Come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. I believe in you, that you died on the cross to take away my sin, and that you were raised from the dead on the third day. Cleanse me and wash me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to serve you for the rest of my life. Help me to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. And we're going to take a few moments and we're going to open our altar for prayer. Maybe you want to come and pray. You pray the prayer with me and you just want to come and talk to God or there's other needs in your life that you need to pray about. Amen. You can come and just find a place to pray at this altar or or there on the benches on the side and you know just just uh, take a few moments to talk to God in your own words amen we're going to sing a song as as we bring this service to a close and allow people to to uh, uh, pray and talk to the Lord uh, themselves amen we fall down we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus and so these altars are open amen you feel free to come amen let's all stand uh, unless you're praying, you can stay seated or come to the altar. We fall down, we lay our crowns at the feet of Jesus. The greatness of His mercy and love at the feet.
thank you, Lord, for your word, my God. Oh, God, we give you all the praise, all the glory. Amen. Amen. You know, getting to heaven is really, it's simple, but it's not easy. He made it simple for us to receive him, to allow him to change us and to help us. And the hardest part about getting to heaven is making up your mind that, you know what? I'm going to serve God. I'm going to do God's will, not my own. That's always the biggest struggle for everybody. And so I encourage you, amen, as you think about your life and how you're living your life, remember, remember, as it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And so we must be ready. We have to prepare ourselves, amen, for what's coming. Amen. You know, if you're a student and you're going to take a test, you, if you're wise, you prepare yourself, correct? Right. You study, you do what you need to do. If, you, if you're going for a job interview, you, you know, you prepare yourself as best as you can because they're going to judge you and say, well, yeah, okay, you're, you're the person we're looking for or no. You know, all of life is like this. Amen. But this is for eternal stakes. Amen. It's not just a quiz. And it's not just a job. This is for eternity. Amen. amen. So let's let's be encouraged. Amen. To be faithful to God. Amen. To serve God and to keep in our memory and in our minds. You know, one day I'm going to stand before God and I want him to be pleased with me. Amen. amen. I want my life to be pleasing to him. And so not just kind of, whoa, scraping in. All of us are going to kind of scrape in anyway, but <laughs> there's rewards, amen, and there's blessing for those who serve God, amen. So we're going to pray. Uh, let's uh, let's bow our heads together as we close this service, amen. Uh, Tom Ryan, would you uh, ask God's blessing as we dismiss? Father, this morning we thank you that there's forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ, uh, and that we can call upon his name and enter.